Wow, it's so bright today. Good morning, people who are here in Nexus. And people who are watching this, whether you are in the regional centers or you are watching this online, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, depending on your time zone. You know, some of you may be joining us for the very first time, either here in Axis, in our regional centers, or wherever you are online. If this is you, I want to take a, this time to welcome you, especially. You are a special guest, and I'm so glad that you are able to join us today. So, you know, we are in a situation right now whereby there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of uncertainty in our hearts. And I believe that as Christians, our outlook to life and our attitude should be different from people who do not know Jesus. You know, during this period of time, I've made a more intentional effort to smile at people whenever I go out, even to strangers as well. And sometimes I will get that kind of uh, stare back at me and say, hey, what, what is this man doing smiling at me, you know? But you know what? As Christians, we have the joy and the peace of God in our heart. And we should bring that together with us wherever we go. So today, why don't we turn to the person sitting around us, give them your biggest smile and tell them, may the joy and the peace of the Lord be with you. Wow, I can hear some laughter. There's really joy happening around here. Praise God. You know, before I go to the, my message this morning, I also want to take some time to pray for some of us today. You know, there may be some of us here, those of you who are watching online, you are unable to come for service, either because you are on leave of absence or quarantine order, or some of you may be anxiously waiting for the COVID-19 test result either for yourself or your loved ones. And some of you are not able to join us because you are able to, you, you, you are not well, you are unwell. And during this time, I would want to spend some time to pray for all of you. So wherever you are, church, let's join our hearts together as we spend some time to pray for these people. Hallelujah. Lord Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you that you are such a wonderful God. And Lord, today we want to commit those people who are unable to join us live, those, those people who are on quarantine orders, on leave of absence, some of them may be anxiously waiting for test results. Lord, we want to pray for them that you can give them the peace that only you can give, the peace that transcends all understanding. Lord, we just ask, ask for the peace to be with them right now, that you will know that you are the God who is in control of all things and you are the God who is watching over them. Lord, I pray for those of us who are unwell, even those of us who are suffering from this COVID-19 virus right now. Lord, we just pray that your healing will be upon them. May you strengthen their body's immune system, that they are able to fight against any virus, any bacteria that, that is causing them to fall sick. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just ask right now, strengthen and heal them. Hallelujah. And Lord, we also thank you for gathering us here this today that we can come together under the authority of your word to hear from you. Lord, I pray they can encourage us with your word today. And may faith arise as we hear your word. Lord, we thank you and we pray and commit this time before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, people. People, we are on a uh, three-part series, okay, a three-part sermon series called God, the Anchor of Our Victory. We know that because of the victory that God has won on the cross, we can live out that victory in our life, even when we come across challenges and, and, and difficulties in our life. But as we confront these challenges and issues in our life, we need to know that our victory over these issues cannot be anchored simply on our human strength and our human effort, our human wisdom. But our victory over all these challenges has to be anchored on something or someone who is strong, powerful, and totally reliable. And we know that we have a God who not only just is concerned and cares for us, but we know that we have a God who is powerful, who is strong, and who is always reliable. That is why our victory should be anchored in God and in His character. You know, while many of us, we may know that God and His character in our head, 
But every time when we come across struggles and challenges in life, we will have questions in our head. We will have doubts about God. Is, does God really care for me? Is God really able to deliver me in my situation? Or even questions like, can I really trust God? Can I really count on God? So in this three-part series, we are going to explore and, and, and study some attributes of God that reflect how God truly is the anchor of our victory. And last week in the first part of the series, Pastor Jeff shared with us from Exodus chapter 3 that our victory is anchored in God's compassion, that our God is a compassionate God. Not only does He care for us, not only does He see our suffering, He hears and He feels what we are going through. And He acts and He will deliver us in our situation. And this week, in part two of this series, we're going to look at how God's power will be able to deliver us in the situation whereby we have no control of. And have you ever been in a situation in your life whereby there seems to be nowhere out? Have you ever been stuck or cornered in a difficult situation whereby you just have nowhere to run and nowhere to hide? Or have you ever been struggling with a particular scene in your life and you keep just doing over and over again and you just feel that there is no victory in your life? You know, perhaps for some of us here, we are in a situation, we are in a difficult financial situation, your loved one may have just been diagnosed with a life-threatening sickness. And the treatment for this sickness is a huge amount of money and there's no insurance coverage for it. And you're at a loss of how, to, how are you going to come up with this money? And you start to wonder whether you can trust God to provide for you. Perhaps for some of you here, your marriage may be in a crisis. You may, your marriage may be failing. You're finding it so difficult, so hard to forgive your spouse for some of the things that have been done towards you over the years. You're finding it so difficult to forgive the hurts that your spouse has caused you. Perhaps some of you may even be affected by this COVID-19 situation right now. Some of you may be anxiously waiting for the test result, either for yourself or for your loved ones. Some of you may be in the service industry and your business, your livelihood is affected by the current situation. And you start to wonder to yourself, why? Why did God allow this to happen? And when is this whole situation going to come to an end? You know, whichever situation you may be in right now, God wants to remind us today that not only is He the God who is concerned about our situation, but He is also the powerful God that can deliver us in the situation that we are in, in whatever difficult situation that we, we may be in. So today, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture from the Bible that shows how God's power delivered the Israelites out from a situation whereby there seems to be no way out. So the title of my message today is Anchored in God's Power. Anchored in God's Power. And we'll cover the entire chapter 14 of Exodus. So we're going to look at the entire chapter 14 of Exodus. We're not going to make everyone read the entire chapter because it's quite a long chapter, 31 verses in all. So our multimedia team has prepared a video to provide us with a background and a summary of this story. So let's just all sit back and relax as we watch the story behind me. After God appoints Moses to deliver Israel, Moses goes with his brother Aaron to Pharaoh and tells him that God wants his people free. Pharaoh rejects. Who is the Lord? Why should I obey his voice and let Israel go? In fact, Pharaoh responds to this request by making the Israelites work even harder. Discouraged, Moses goes back to God and says, this plan is not going to work. God answers Moses. He repeats the promise he has made to Israel's forefathers. He shares his concern and compassion for Israel as they suffer under oppression. He promises that he is going to act to rescue them. He will bring about redemption for Israel to free them from slavery. He will take them as his people and be their God. Pharaoh defiantly resists God's command. Then God sends 10 different plagues upon Egypt. They come one after another, like turning water into blood, 
the arrival of pests and disease. The plagues confront Pharaoh and the Egyptian gods that they believe in, and they display God's power, purposes, and sovereignty. They also mark the distinction of Israel and Egypt. The people of Israel were protected. The plagues challenge Pharaoh, and yet he refuses to humble himself and comply. It comes to a climax at the 10th plague, where God declares that the firstborn sons across Egypt shall die. This final plague compels Pharaoh to finally let Israel go free. Yet as soon as they leave, Pharaoh has a change of heart. He regrets letting Israel leave from serving the Egyptians. Pharaoh sends his army to pursue the people of Israel and finds them cornered by the Red Sea. By God's power, the Red Sea parts and Israel passes into freedom. This chapter closes as the people of Israel sing to the Lord, praising Him for redeeming them. <laughs> Praise God! So from the story, we saw how Pharaoh finally relented and agreed to let the Israelites go out of Egypt. But later on, we also discovered that he had a change of mind. So how did all this happen? Follow me as I take all of us through the rest of this story. You know, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, God started to lead them on a particular route towards the land of Canaan. God promised that they would settle in the land of Canaan, and God started to lead them on a particular route towards the land of Canaan. So how God did this was He guided them with this pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. So the pillar of cloud will be, will be there in the daytime, and the pillar of fire will be there in the nighttime. And these two pillars are always ahead of the Israelites, providing the direction as to where they need to go. So we can read about this in Exodus chapter 13. And as we step into Exodus chapter 14, we found God giving Moses a very strange set of instruction. God told Moses in verse 2, He says, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp near Pihaharaf, between Migdor and the sea. They are to camp by the sea directly opposite Beazephon. So instead of continuing on their journey towards the promised land, towards the land of Canaan, God is telling them to suddenly turn back and camp by this site that's near the sea. Now this is a very strange instruction because by turning back, they are actually making it easier for the Egyptians to catch up with them. And by camping at this area that's by the sea, they are actually putting themselves in a very, very dangerous position. So in front of them is the sea, and around them are mountains. And the only way that they can possibly get out is the only way they came in from. So this puts them in a very dangerous position. And then God went on to explain to Moses why did he give this instruction. He says here in verse 3 to verse 4, Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. So by this change in direction, God is actually wanting to trick Pharaoh into thinking that the Israelites are actually confused and lost in the desert, so that Pharaoh will go after the Israelites. And then... God is going to do something that will bring glory to Him. Meanwhile, in the Egyptian palace, Pharaoh and his officials had a meeting and they suddenly realized the impact of their decision to let the Israelites go. You know, overnight, they lost their entire nation's labor force. They're wondering, how are we going to build the pyramid right now. There are no workers, there are no laborers to do all the hard labor. And they, that's why, because of that, they had a change of mind. And they decided to go after the Israelites. So Pharaoh gathered all his entire army. He gathered his chariots and he decided to go after Israel, the Israelites. In verse 9, it says, the Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pihaharaf, opposite Beir Zipan. 
So because the Israelites turned back, it became easier. It, it makes it easier for the Egyptian army to catch up with them. Back at the Israelite camp, as they look back, they see a, a dust cloud coming towards them. And they're wondering, is that a bird? Is that a herd of animals running towards us? And to their surprise, they saw the Egyptian army marching towards them. Can you imagine the fear? They were gripped by fear when they realized that the Egyptian army was coming towards them and they suddenly realized that they had no way out of the situation. Because in front of them is a sea and they cannot cross the sea. Around them are mountains and behind them are the Egyptian armies marching towards them. They were so desperate, they were so they started to panic and there's nothing they can do except to cry out and start to complain and put the blame on Moses. They told Moses, Moses, look at what you have done. Was it because there was no grave in Egypt that you're bringing us out to the desert to die? By the way, that's a sarcastic remark, okay? Was it because there was no grave in Egypt that now you have to bring us out to the desert to die? Look at what you have done by bringing us us out of, the, of Egypt. We already told you back in Egypt to leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. We would rather die, or we would rather serve the Egyptians than to die now in the desert. So the Israelites started to complain. They started to cry out to Moses and blame Moses for all these things that happened to him. But little did they know that this was all part of God's plan. They didn't know that this was all part of God's plan and God's power was already at work even though they are not seeing it. And this is the first lesson that we can learn today, that God's power shows us His sovereignty. God's power shows us His sovereignty. You know, in His sovereignty, God already knew that Pharaoh would change his mind that he will chase after the Israelites. How do we know that? We can know that by the fact that God declared that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. He will harden Pharaoh's heart. He said that in verse 4 and verse 8, so that Pharaoh will go after the Israelites. You know, when I say that God will harden Pharaoh's heart, I'm not saying that God is responsible for the evil deeds of Pharaoh. No, no way. God is not responsible for the evil deeds of Pharaoh. From the start, we already knew that Pharaoh was an evil and cruel man from the way how he oppressed and how he mistreated the Israelites. In fact, God has given Pharaoh many chances for him to repent and to let the Israelites go throughout the ten plagues. But each time, Pharaoh stubbornly do not want to repent until a point in time whereby God decided enough was enough and he decided to use this evil man to accomplish his purpose. God's power and God's sovereignty is shown in the fact that God can steer evil towards his own purpose. You know, the evil plan of Pharaoh was to recapture the Israelites so that he can enslave them again. But God demonstrated his power and sovereignty by turning this plan towards his good purposes. You know, as we look at the responses of the Israelites, in a situation like that where they face a dead-end situation, we need to also reflect upon our responses and our attitude when we encounter challenges and struggles in our life. You know, the Israelites, they are people who have just witnessed the power of God in Egypt throughout the ten plagues. But right now, when they are in a situation whereby there seems to be no way out, that they are stuck between the sea and the, and the Egyptian army. They suddenly just forgot about what God has done before. And they start to complain and they start to blame everybody. They were crying out to God. This is such an irony. Because in the earlier part of Exodus, these people were crying out to God for deliverance from slavery. But now that God has taken them out of slavery, they were crying to say that they want to go back to become slaves. Isn't it such an irony? And the truth is, some of us, we are just like 
the Israelites in this story. Even though we, God has already set us free from the bondage of sin, but we continue to live our life with no sense of the victory. Then whenever we hit challenges and problems in our life, we start to complain, we start to gr grumble. You know, perhaps for some of you, we may be going through a tough situation in your life right now, and you have a very tough work situation. You have a hostile work environment whereby your colleagues, they are mean to you. Your bosses are very demanding to you. You face pressure and you stress all around you. And there seems to be no way to get out of this situation. Perhaps for some of you, you may have made a bad financial decision and you end up in debt. The debt is so big that you can never imagine how you are going to repay this debt, and there seems to be no way out. Even though you are not able to see God in this situation, but God wants to remind us today that He is sovereign in your situation. God is sovereign in your situation. God knows what is going through. God always has a plan, and God is working behind the scene. God is continually continuously at work in your life, even though we may not see it. Some of us, we may be tempted to complain. Like the Israelites, whenever we hit roadblocks, whenever we hit challenges in our life, we may be tempted to complain. That is where we need to learn to be patient. To learn to be patient, to, to trust in God's sovereignty, that God will deliver us in our situation. So how is God's plan of deliverance going to take place? We continue our story to see how God will deliver His people. You know, when, when the people of Israel, they started to complain about Moses, Moses stood bravely in front of them and said, Hey, you people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you're going to see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. And the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So Moses, while he was steady and brave before the Israelites, actually he was quite nervous. That's why he came to God and he cried out to God. He cried out to God because he's at a loss of what to do. He doesn't know what to do. And then God said to him, Moses, why are you crying out to me. Tell the Israelites to move on. You know, in the Singlish translation, God is essentially telling Moses, Moses, why you come to me and cry, Father? You know I am not dead, right? So tell the Israelites to move on. And Moses looked at God, must have, he must be puzzled. How? How to move on? In front of me is the sea. Behind me, the enemies are, are just right behind us. How do we move on? And God told Moses, raise your staff, stretch your hand over the seas, and divide the sea so that the Israelites can cross the sea on dry ground. Moses must have looked at God in a very puzzled way and said, really, God? You want me to do that? And being an obedient servant of God, Moses obeyed the instruction. And we saw a great miracle taking place right before their eyes. This is what verse 21 and verse 22 tell us. That all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And as the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, the pillar of cloud that was in front of them moved behind them. Moved to behind them so that it formed a separation between the Egyptians and the Israelites. So there was light on the side of the Israelites and there was darkness. There was darkness on the side of the Egyptians. So the light enables the Israelites to cross the Red Sea during the night. And the darkness kept the Egyptians from coming close to them. And as the last 
Israelite crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and reached the other side. God allowed the Egyptians to go after them. God allowed the Egyptians to start to pursue them. And in another great display of his power, God threw the Egyptians into confusion by using the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And God even jammed the wheels of the chariots so that it is difficult to drive the chariots across the sea. And it was at this point in time that the Egyptian soldiers suddenly realized that it is the Almighty God that's fighting against them. And they shouted, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting us. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Let's get away from them. So people, not only does God's power show us His sovereignty, the second lesson that we can learn here is God's power teaches us to depend on His strength. God's power teaches us to depend on His strength. You know, numerically speaking, there were more Israelites than the Egyptian army. An estimated number of Israelites that left Egypt was uh, about 2 million people. So in terms of numbers, the Israelites have more people than the Egyptian army. But we must know that in reality, they are no match for the well-trained and professional army of Pharaoh. You know, the Israelites, they have been traveling on foot for many days. They were tired. They have the young, they have the old, they have the women, and they have the animals with, together with them. So there's just no way they can be a match to fight against the Egyptian army. They realize that by their own strength, there is no way they can defeat the Egyptian army. That is why. That is why they cry out to Moses. That's why they started blaming Moses. And look at what Moses told them. What did Moses tell them? Stand firm and you will see the Lord's deliverance on you today. Stand firm. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You know, by telling them to be still, Moses is not telling them, just be still and do nothing. Just do nothing. But the Hebrew translation for this word, to be still, is actually better translated as, you just keep quiet. You just keep quiet. So God is actually rebuking the Israelites through Moses to tell them that, hey, you of little faith, didn't I show you how powerful I am in Egypt? Now you just keep quiet, you just shut up and see how I will deliver you in the Red Sea. Through a miraculous display of His power, by working through Moses, God parted the Red Sea. Some people may say that scientifically it is possible for the wind to separate the sea. But let me tell you another thing. That God even caused the ground of the sea to be so dry that when the Egyptian army went after them, they did not realize that they were crossing the Red Sea. Now, there is no way scientists can prove that. How can a seabed be so dry if a wind just blow and separate it? But because of God, that is the situation. The seabed was so dry that when the Egyptians chased after them, they did not realize that they were actually crossing the sea. You must know that this is a bunch of well-trained professional army. Surely they will know that they are walking into an ambush. But over here, none of them realize because it looks perfectly like a road to them. They never realize that they are crossing the parted sea. And to prevent them to prevent the Egyptian soldiers from catching up with the Israelite, God threw them into confusion with the pillar of cloud and with the pillar of fire. How he did that, I don't know. The Bible didn't say. Okay? And on top of that, God even jammed the wheels of the chariots. And at a point in time, the, Israel, the Egyptians just realized that, oh, they are fighting against Almighty God, that it was God who was fighting against them all this while. You know, people, God has already won the victory for us. 
And because of this, we can depend on God's strength to carry us through in our times of need, in our times of difficulty. Do not be like the Israelites. After experiencing the power of God in Egypt, they should already know that God is fighting for them. Yet, when they encounter the Dead Sea, the, sorry, the, when they encounter the Dead End situation at the Red Sea, they again forgot about God and they tried to resolve the issue on their own. They start to think back on what they should have done, that perhaps they shouldn't have followed Moses out of Egypt. Likewise, when we are stuck in a situation in our life, our natural tendency is always to want to resolve things on our own effort. That we do not come before God to seek Him and to depend on God's power, to, to, to depend on God's strength to deliver us. Many times, instead of slowing down, coming before God in prayer, we just try to rush into the situation to try to resolve it on our own human effort, on our own human strength. And this is especially true for the men. No man, we have that pride within us, we have that male ego that we, we just refuse to seek help. You know, every time when I go overseas and I get lost, my wife will say, go and ask people, what's the direction? And I, I will say, no, I know how to navigate ourselves out of this situation. You know, it's always that male pride and ego that prevents us from seeking help. And it often takes a major setback before we realize our human limitations. For many of us, we will think that because of our education, because of our life experiences, we can navigate our problems in life. We, can, we are able to do it. And we only come to God as a last resort. We only come to God as a last resort after we have exhausted all our means. You know, today God is telling us, don't. Don't struggle on your own anymore. God has won us the victory. We can depend on His strength to carry us through. Don't struggle on your own effort. Perhaps there are some of you here, you have been struggling with a particular sin in your life and you're finding that you have no victory. You know, the solution to this is not to try harder not to commit a sin. But the solution to this is to look towards the finished work of Jesus on the cross and to ask the Holy Spirit to just come and help us, to come and strengthen us in our struggle. You know, know that God is powerful. Our God is powerful. Can I hear amen? amen? Our God is powerful and we can depend on His strength to see us through our struggle. At this point, I just want to share a story with you. This is a story about Rosalind. Rosalind is our member in the West Center. And three years ago, she went through a darkest patch of her life when she contracted cancer. So let's watch this story together with, with, with me as we see how God carried Rosalind through in those difficult times. Amen. Please roll the video. I'm Rosalind. I'm in the family group. Uh, I have two girls. They are currently 11 and 9. I'm a childcare principal. In October 2016, I discovered that there was a lump on my right bosom. It was about 3.2 cm. And at that time, it was a bit worrying. But um, I tell myself, since I am still studying and I need to complete my specialist tip in three months time, I decided to put on hold. I went to the doctor, but I asked for a mammogram date to be much later. But in December, when I went for the mammogram, I realized it was a, a very undesirable one. Because the moment uh, I received the call from a doctor, I know it's something going to be very serious. Because doctor said that, uh, he told me, Madam Lee, you got to prepared to go to NE immediately because we see some shadows in your uh, mammogram scan and we don't think it is good news at all. So it was very mind-blowing. Uh, it was stage 2B when I was diagnosed. They sent it for biopsy and after that I realised I was like 
uh, stage 2B and then the even worst news is it spreads it has spread even to my limb nodes and then of the 24 limb nodes two limb nodes were already affected and doctor said it is very aggressive I have to go for surgery immediately so I went in on the 10th of January basically I'm already in my late 40s so from young until then I'm someone who don't really fall sick but then now it's cancer you know it's like I of all people of the billions of people in the whole world why me you know I also ask God you know it's like I cannot take it also because I have two young girls who are only in the primary school so my very first thought is what is going to happen to them if I'm not around I was having mixed feelings like how should I behave or how should I um, bear with this cancer thing because I was really in a loss actually I don't know how to respond anymore because to me I think I've been a faithful Christian and I also do uh, things to keep myself right in terms of my conscience with God and man for me to have this actually I have a question mark and it's a big question mark God why must this happen to me I remember during December 2016 when I was told that it was cancerous I remember throughout the service in Christmas I was crying to God non-stop from the beginning to the end I was like God of all people it's me why me you know I was like I could not stop crying and I could not stop asking why I imagine myself carrying two heavy bags of rice 10 kg on each side and it was so burdensome I think I cannot bear it anymore I remembered myself crying and crying and crying non-stop and I tell myself I think enough is enough I just decide to throw the two heavy bags of rice in front of God and lay them before God and tell them God is enough I cannot take it anymore I just let you take control that was what I did and then I just felt God's peace during the healing restoration in my life in my heart I cannot really describe the kind peace but uh, it's just like the silver lining beyond the clouds when I decided to let go and let God take control no longer do I worry whether oh will my girls in good hands or not if I leave early or or what's gonna to happen to my family or what's gonna to happen to people who cared for me. It's like it's no longer so critical anymore because I see the bigger picture that God is in control. At that moment I I felt that I could see light at the end of the tunnel. The surgery was a success because I don't have any um, so-called repercussion after it. Everything was one after another with the surgery followed by chemo, followed by radiotherapy. Yeah. The only part <laughs> that has the side effect was the acting out of my eczema after the radiotherapy. It was very bad, very bad on my forehead, on my face until Actually, I don't wish to leave the house. I even wish to dig a hole on the ground and just put my head in because it was very unappealing. But God was good. He actually led me to this uh, spa clinic that does uh, skin issues, people who have skin conditions. After I completed this course, I became this spa clinic's uh, endorsed spokesperson and I also managed to get two years free products usage um, being the spokesperson I was thankful that God has provided a way even though I was so-called physically tormented but he has shown himself good to me again because I was supposed to graduate in January yet my surgery was also in January my lecturers and my 
group mates, they were very kind. I mean, they allowed me to do what I can before I go for surgery. So I thank God for giving the miraculous hand and support at that time when I really needed it. For me, I believe that God who began a good work in me will bring it to a complete finish. He has never failed me. And from ever since I knew him at 12 until now today, he has always assured me that he's in control and that he will always be the set of footprints that will carry me. Not me walking alone, but he will be the one that will be carrying me. Wow! What an amazing story. In her battle with cancer, Rosalind learned the important lesson. In surrendering her situation to God and allow God to carry her through the difficult time of her life. Now today, we are so glad that we have such a God. We have this God who can carry us through our difficult times. So people, let's give God a big hand, shall we? Let me bring us back to the final part of our story in Exodus 14. You know, when the Israelites, no, when the Egyptians realized that it was the mighty God that was fighting against them, it was already too late. God told Moses to stretch his hands over the sea. And then the waters start to flow back to its original position. And by daybreak, the sea was back to its place, destroying the entire Egyptian army and all the chariots that went after the Israelites. No one survived. Not one of them survived. God delivered the Israelites from the hands of the Egyptians that day. And in the final verse, verse 31 of Exodus 14, this is what it says. It says, When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him and in Moses, His servants. The people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him. And this takes us to the final lesson that we can learn from this story, that God's power assures us that we can trust in Him. God's power assures us that we can trust in Him. In the final display of power, God destroyed the entire Egyptian army and the chariots that went after the Israelites. In contrast, verse 29 tells us that the Israelites, they went across the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. So the, Egypt, uh, the Israelites, they were able to cross the Red Sea on dry ground. You know, when the Israelites on the other side saw the bodies of the Egyptian soldiers and the broken chariots on the seashore, it was a very graphic confirmation to them that God's deliverance for them out of Egypt is very real and complete. The Egyptian soldiers, the powerful Egyptian soldiers, who used to oppress them, who used to strike fear in their heart, they were now all lying dead on the seashore. The chariots, the chariots were the most sophisticated military te uh, technology at that time. It represents the power of Egypt, and by destroying this symbol of power completely, God is telling the Israelites that no matter how powerful your enemy is, God is more powerful than them. He's assuring them that nothing can stop him. He is more powerful than even the most powerful enemy. In destroying the Egyptian army, at the Red Sea, God also completed the deliverance of His people from the bondage of slavery. This shows that God is faithful and God keeps to His word. 
And this is another assurance to the Israelites that God, they can trust in God's power and God will deliver them. You know, people, when we first read this story, we may think that this is a story about the struggle between the Israelites and the Egyptians. But as we reflect further, we will know that the main crux of this story is not about the struggle between the Israelites and the Egyptians, but the main point of this story is about the struggle between the Israelites and God. On whether the Israelites will continue to trust God even when they are faced with a seemingly dead-end situation. And today, we have to ask this question for ourselves. Do we continue to trust God even when we are faced with a seemingly dead-end situation? Even though we have seen God's power in our lives, in many lives before, when it comes to us, when it comes to a difficult situation, do we continue to trust God? In the current COVID-19 situation that we are in, are we living lives, are we living our lives in a way that reflect that we trust a God that has already won the victory? Or are we no different from people who do not know God? For some of us, we may also have that preconceived ideas on how God should deliver us. And when the preconceived ideas do not happen, our trust in God starts to get shaken. We have already learned that God is sovereign and He has complete picture. He knows what is happening. And we don't. And sometimes God will deliver us from our situation. Example, we may be in a very dangerous situation and God intervened to save us in that situation. But at times, God can also deliver us through our situation. We can see that through the many Christians who lost their lives for the faith throughout history. God delivered them through their situation. Whichever way God may choose to deliver us, we need to continue to trust Him because He is sovereign and He knows what He is doing. You know, people, even though this story that we have read in Exodus 14 happened more than 3,000 years ago, the God who was responsible for this event is the same God that we are worshipping today. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same power that delivered the Israelites from the bondage of slavery is the same power that we have access today. We have access to the same power today. And it is this power that can give us the victory and we need to anchor our victory in that power. I understand that in the situation that we are in right now, there can be a, a lot of fear in our hearts, there can be a lot of uncertainty, not knowing how the situation would develop. And it doesn't get better when we read news about cases of confirmed cases that are linked to churches. Some of us may even be facing pressures from our parents, from our loved ones, from our close friends, not to attend church, not to attend service. People, let me tell you one thing. The church is not an organization. It's not an organization whereby one day we can suddenly say, hey, because of this situation, let's all work from home. And the church is not an event. Church is not an event whereby, hey, because something happened, let's cancel the event, let's postpone the event. But the church is a community. The church is a community whereby people do lives together. This is my family. This is home. I know of people here whom I've seen their children growing up. Their children play with my kids, and now they're all grown up. This is truly 
home and this is truly family. We can't just say, let's close church. Because this is what church is all about. It's about a community. We can't be a community if we are all alone. That's why I want to encourage all of us, no matter what, even if you are watching it online, do it as a community. On the one hand, we don't want to be irresponsible people who just want to contribute to the spread of the virus. But on the other hand, we also shouldn't be living in fear. You know, I just want to let all of us know that throughout the past few weeks, the church staff has been working extremely hard to make this place a safe environment to worship God in. Even at 3 a.m. at night, there are messages still going on. So the church staff has done what we can to put in precautionary measures to make this place a safe place that we can worship God in. And really, people, let's take this time to appreciate all the church staff, shall we? You know, while we can put in all precautionary precautionary measures, we need everyone to do our part. We need everyone to cooperate to cooperate and to do this together. So if you are really unwell, do not come to service. Watch our service online and continue with your life group when you are well. Come to service as well. So we need everybody to cooperate in this difficult moment and together we can have victory over this situation. Amen? Amen. You know, fear is the natural response to something unknown. Fear is the natural response to something unknown. But as Christians, we need to be able to confront this fear, this unknown, with what we know about God and His character. We need to confront the unknown with what we already know about God and His character. And we need to take a step of faith. When we declare with all our heart that God is powerful, what are we actually saying? Ask ourselves this question. When we declare with all our heart that God is powerful, what are we actually declaring? That God has no control over this virus situation? That God is unable to protect the church? No. When we say that God is powerful, we know for sure that He has the power to protect the church in all situations. Can I have an amen? God can protect the church in all situations. And because God allowed Christians to be infected with this virus, we know that He has a purpose for this. What is that purpose? I'm not able to tell you. But I do know that God is sovereign and we can trust Him in His sovereignty. I just want to end my sharing by sharing this story that I've read from the Sword and Light website. This is a story about Dr. Leong Ho Nam. The name Dr. Leong Ho Nam, I'm sure is a very familiar name among many of us right now. Dr. Leong, he's an infectious disease specialist. And during this period of time, we have seen him on TV, we have seen him on, we have heard him on radio, giving many useful advice on the COVID-19 situation. Some of us probably didn't know that Dr. Leong, he's a SARS survivor in 2003. Dr. Leong contracted SARS when he treated the first SARS patient in Singapore in 2003. He only discovered that when he went on a conference overseas and he was being quarantined at this hospital in Germany. When the symptoms developed, he went through a really hard time. He really suffered badly as a result of the SARS virus. He was having difficulty breathing and he was having very bad cough, very bad hacking cough. And every time he changed his position, his body posture, he would cough out blood. Eventually, his situation improved. He started to recover. And while he was recovering in hospital, he became bored and he wanted to read the book. 
and the only English book that was available for him was an English Bible passed to him by his wife. His wife was a new believer at the time. So he took the English Bible and he started to read the Gospel of Luke. And he started to know this person, Jesus, from the Bible. But at that time, he still could not believe whether God is real or not. So after the SARS period, Dr. Leong went to London to pursue his PhD. And it was in London that he hit a roadblock in his life. He had a research issue whereby he hit, his experiments keep failing. So he hit a roadblock, the experiments in his research were not working, and he then remembered about this person, Jesus, that he has read in the Bible. And he decided to pray to God to help him in his experiments. The first time he prayed, nothing happened. Second time he prayed, nothing happened. Pray a few more times, still nothing happened. I told you God is sovereign, right? You don't expect him to work the way we want him to work. Until one day, he decided to change his prayer and he prayed a very bold prayer to submit himself to the authority of God, regardless of the result of his experiment. And the moment he prayed that prayer, wow, he literally felt God's presence just surrounding him. He felt as if God was hugging him and was assuring him, you are my son. You are my beloved son. At that moment, people, whatever stress he has about his experiment, about his research, just suddenly just all melt away. When he realized at that moment that God is the most important thing in his life, that knowing God is more important than the success of his experiment. And as he looked back at his faith journey, this was what he shared. He said, God is very, very, very dear to me. If I had to go through SARS a hundred times over just to know the God whom I love, I would do it. As we read this story, perhaps there are some of us in our midst that do not know this God yet. You may have heard about God you may have been to a Christian school, you may even have read about the Bible, but you do not have a relationship with God. Just as how God sent Moses to deliver the Israelites from their bondage of slavery, God has also sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to redeem us from the bondage of our sin. What is sin? Sin is sin are the things in life that we have done that we are not proud of. Sin can manifest itself in many ways. Sin can manifest itself in uncontrolled anger, in rage, in lust, in jealousy, in telling things that are not truthful. And sin separates us from a God who loves us. Sin will lead to a place whereby we don't want to be. We do not want it to be. Sin leads to a dead end. Sin leads to a Red Sea situation whereby we have no way out. And God has sent a deliverer to us. That deliverer is the name, is the person Jesus. Jesus came to deliver us from the bondage of sin. And in order for that deliverance to take place, we need to cross the Red Sea. We need to leave our past behind us and take a step to cross the Red Sea, just like how the Israelites left their life behind in Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. And today, God is saying that He wants to de deliver you, but you have to put your current lifestyle behind you and make a decision to follow Jesus. Make a decision to follow Jesus. If today, this is your desire, you want to start to follow Jesus and have a relationship with God. 
I'm going to give you some time to respond later. As for the rest of us, let's put aside our things as we spend some time to worship this God and to respond to His Word. Let's do that right now, shall we?